Hello, hello. It seems like it's time to us for us to start. Um, the lights are really bright and you're all very dark, so I don't see you very well. But uh, welcome, my name is Andre. I work on the Jetpack Compose, and today we'll be talking about how Jetpack Compose team uses Kotlin internally to make sure that we go fast, because performance is really important to us. So uh, for those who don't know, and the majority of the people here do know what Compose is, but just to reiterate, uh, Jetpack Compose is a declarative UI framework and built completely with Kotlin from the ground up. Every single bit of it is written only in Kotlin. And the first table release for Android was back in 2021. Uh, so Jetpack Compose is part of the bigger family of libraries uh, in Android X, uh, just specifically for modern Android development. Uh, and there is also a multi-platform part that is developed by the JetBrains. Majority of the code between those two is shared, so majority of the Jetpack Compose is actually in a common code, and we work closely with the JetBrains to develop the second part. But today, I'll be talking mostly about Android. Um, with the Jetpack Compose, we focus mostly on a single thread performance. Um, for us, it is quite important because in modern devices, you have kind of big cores on your processor and a little cores. And we want to make sure that we stay on a main thread on a big core and don't downgrade main thread accidentally or to the little cores and make every, f every part of the system slow down. We also operate on a obvious CPU and GPU constraints, mostly kind of governed by the battery power. Most of your consumer devices probably have some kind of battery. Your watches have even less battery, even less CPU in them. And then there is also some weird things that run uh, Android, such as maybe your lawnmower or your fridge or something like that. And we want to make sure that people that write applications for those devices also could use Jetpack Compose. So we optimize even for those use cases, maybe somewhat indirectly. There is also memory constraints, but uh, it doesn't apply to most devices because Compose doesn't consume a lot of memory, at least right now. But we still try to make sure that we fit into constraints and reduce memory leaks or something like that. And obviously, as every UI framework, we operate under strict frame budget. So it's 60 FPS, 120 FPS. We need to make sure that the frame is submitted by the deadline. Otherwise, it's called stutter junk, and it's not great. So when you start looking for performance in something that is slow, the first thing you, you need is some tools. So you measure and understand what is slow. And the first thing that we have is the benchmarks. We have a benchmark that's run after every change and create these really nice dashboards that show how we get faster progressively. We have different kind of benchmarks, like full up things or just small pieces of Compose that just run separately from each other. And after every change, as we run the benchmark, we can also create an alert. And that alert allows us to detect the regressions early and fix them. Like, for example, in this screenshot, you probably don't see the labels on top, but uh, there is like it goes from January to April, and somewhere in March we had like a regression in there. Something in layout was slow, but it was detected real quickly, fixed within the week, and we continued on course to be like performance target for 1.7 the next release. The second thing, when we identified like some pieces that uh, some pieces that are slow, we want them to be faster. We go to profilers and we identify what exactly in the benchmark that we just created is slow. So Android Studio has a really great set of the profilers, memory tracing, uh, perfetto traces, and uh, what else, like allocation things. So it, it's, it's really great for those things. And for Android, it's basically all you need. Other platforms have their own tools. Um, and I'm pretty sure if you're familiar with the platform, you will be familiar with the tools quite quickly. And the last thing, which is a bit different, uh, I didn't see that before in many places, is the performance lens. So Certain parts of Kotlin, that so there are certain parts of Kotlin that we identify to be kind of slow. As you see here, like some of them are highlighted in red, and I'll be talking about some of them uh, later. But the interesting part for now is that we try to kind of find small pieces of Kotlin that can be sped up by simple changes. For example, replacing for each with a version that doesn't create an iterator for a list iteration or something like that. And by that, we kind of nudge people to the happy path of performance because now they, uh, like the IDE tells them that you don't have to use it, you just use the faster version. And because of that, the speed up of each particular piece is not that big, but across the whole application, you actually get quite a lot of benefits. The next thing that I found really useful is to know the pipeline, how your code compiles from source code to bytecode or whatever the the representations there are, and also it's really useful to check the output of all of your tools. For example, for Android, 
we have Android sources that are getting compiled through the Kotlin compiler to JVM bytecode. This is our first stop. We can go to like different decompilers for the JVM bytecode, expect inspect what is happening there, and see maybe there are some allocations introduced to places we didn't want. So maybe Kotlin did something interesting that we also didn't want it to do. Uh, for Android, the story doesn't end here because we cannot really interpret JVM bytecode. We need to go like levels deeper, and this is Dex bytecode. For that, we use the, the digital green tools D8 and then optimizer R8. Uh, both of those tools are really interesting on what they do, and it's really useful to check their output because sometimes they actually optimize the things that Kotlin introduces or something like that. And later, when you run things on device, they actually get op optimized for the target uh, target architecture for the assembly. Uh, so the same goes for mainland GDK, obviously, like it has its own uh, just in time compilation. And sometimes you can also check those outputs. It depends on the platform. On Android, we can check, uh, for example, output of the ahead of time compilation for some tools that are available on the platform. And uh, when I'm thinking about that, I'm, I'm usually thinking about this as a spectrum, like where you, how deep you need to go, depending on how often um, your code gets executed. So for example, we have like things like collections, or we have things like some UI primitives. So if you were working with Compose, you probably know there's like a DP or constraints kind of value classes. So we want to make sure that they're very optimized down to like assembly level because we use them very often, almost everywhere. But as we go up levels uh, to like higher order libraries, such as material or um, foundation or something like that, and uh, to your app code, those things are usually executed like once per screen, maybe a few times when you update things. And it's no longer important to go that deep, uh, that deep into pipeline. You just want to make sure that you don't do anything weird in there with the algorithm and that in general it all looks good like from the performance standpoint. All right, so this is the theoretical part. We have eight more minutes, and I'll be just going through a few things that we actually linked against that we identified that was kind of slow. So I just wanted to present you a few examples here. Uh, I call it mixtape here, but technically it's like more like medley. That's the more correct musical term, just a bunch of kind of kind of connected but not really connected musical things, well, performance things here. So the first rule that we found in Compose is that we want to avoid GC. Uh, garbage collection is faster than it used to be on Android, but it's still kind of slow. It introduces a lot of slowdowns. And the worst offender of that is the generics when they are used with primitives because you introduce boxing on the JVM platforms. So quick benchmark, we have mutable state of int and we have mutable int state of. Th those are identical. Uh, the only difference is that mutable int state of just had her coded field with the primitive int value directly there. So here we get 50% speed up in this particular benchmark when we write to a thousand times. Uh, it was saying here it was on pixel two, which is something that we identified like a year or two ago. And after that, we went pretty big on this. So we have mutable instead of, long, float, whatever is follow. Interesting part, Boolean is the primitive, but it only has two values. So we don't have to optimize for that because those are just pre-allocated. It's all great. Um, so yeah, we have mutable instead of int list. Uh, float, longs, and doubles follow. Int set, object int map, int object map, int int map, int float map, float int, whatever the combination there is. Um, and yeah, just saving on those things in kind of UI places when you are running during the frame actually helps a lot because you just see way less between frames, you do delay frames, this is great. I'll be coming back to some of the maps a bit later, but for now let's continue with allocations. So in Kotlin, we have lambdas. And those are also kind of hidden generics, in a way, because this syntax really hides this signature, um, which is what get compiled out of the lambda itself. And the interesting part about this signature is that first you allocate the value to actually pass it there, obviously. But when you have something like this, when you receive an end and return an end, you actually allocate two integers, one to pass it, uh, pass to the function, and one to return from a function. And the reason for that is that because Kotlin generates like a body of the function separately, and then it creates a wrapper to kind of conform to this interface of the function one, which is just like takes boxes as value and just boxes it back to conform to any. And we got really burnt on this with the um, value classes 
because those are kind of the same as the primitives, so just wrapped with the custom class, not just any, any box things. Um, and certain things right now in Compose, just they're constrained by the binary compatibility. We cannot fix them right now, but they're just allocating on every lambda just because we didn't think that it actually will allocate every time when we return this thing. Uh, the fix for that is pretty simple. Just use fun interfaces. Those just create this usual method call, and the syntax for those things is the same as the lambdas practically. Just like you have to introduce a new interface, which is like a bit annoying sometimes. So the collections. I already alluded that there are like custom collections in our uh, code base now, and uh, well, all of those like int, object, inset, and whatever. Those are based on the scatter set and scatter maps. So those are uh, kind of the generic versions, the drop-in replacement for the hash map and hash set. In most places, there are some difference. And they are based on the AppSeal uh, flat hash map from C++ world. Some of you may be familiar with that particular place. So it's like open addressing hash map. And the interesting part about it is that first it is faster to iterate over. That was really important for Compose in particular. Uh, but also, it doesn't allocate entries internally when you insert into hash map. So still in a slide from Roma's deck from uh, Paris, we got some uh, we got some benchmarks on the Pixel 2. We insert 1,000 elements, remove and uh, iterate over 1,000 elements. And we get like 70% speed up for insertion, 80% speed up for uh, iteration. Those collections are available as part of the Android X collection. Like a year ago it was released, so maybe somewhere in November. So you're also free to use them in your code base if you want. Um, also, the interesting part here is that removal is a bit slower, but Compose doesn't really remove elements from HashMap that often. We usually just put things into HashMap and clear it uh, at the end of the frame, sometimes iterate over it. So it's, those two are way more uh, important to us and also optimized way more, obviously. Okay, so the last thing for today is the coroutines. We'll really love coroutines in Compose. Like the whole pointer input, scrolling, and all of that is based on the coroutines, the API for that. The, the coroutines allowed us to create great API, so it just kind of provide us a great base for that. But recently, we started identifying certain places where coroutines are actually slow. For example, we have this type of pattern in a modifier.node. It's like our new replace for modifier. It's like class node that has attach and detach. Whenever you show on the screen, it's attached. When you remove it from screen, it's detached. Pretty simple. So we launch something in there. Uh, we collect from some flow, some events maybe, and then we cancel when we detach. Pretty simple because we don't want to collect uh, from flow anymore. So what we found is that collecting uh, from flow is actually pretty fast. All, all calling any suspend function is actually really fast. But launching things is kind of slow. And cancel, I think, is kind of slow. Uh, they're slow for similar yet different reasons. So launch is kind of slow-ish because it has to do a lot of like uh, kind of atomic stuff because the coroutines are designed to be multi-threaded. We don't really use that much, so we just get the slow down there. Um, cancellation is slow for a bit different reasons, but it's also kind of related to how many coroutines you have running in this particular launch code. And obviously, this is slow down is kind of relative to how much like node cost. So we just like add this launch and we accidentally are slowed down by like half the time that it was to create a node. So we don't want to do it. Um, so we didn't really find a way to optimize that yet. But what we do is launching some of the collections later. So for example, we have some nodes that collect in pointer events like here. And we probably could just like launch this collection after we receive the first event. So we just only subscribe to the consequent events, and that's it. So if we didn't receive any pointers events, like majority of the modifier nodes really don't receive pointer events. You just scroll through them. They don't care about the events that they get there. Um, so the, then the cancellation is free, because it doesn't cancel anything. OK, and the last thing about coroutines is the channels, in particular the conflated kind. So uh, we were using nodes for to schedule things to be run at the end of the frame. And interestingly enough, channel conflated uh, is like 10 times slower than the channel with the capacity of one. And the reason for that is that conflated channel basically takes the new element, it puts it inside the buffer, and removes the old one. But the channel with the capacity of one does the opposite. It kind of like, take, if the element is already there, it just drops it. So it's much much more cheaper, just compare unit with unit and just drop it instead of like replacing the whole thing. 
Um, we already reported, obviously, all those things to Kotlin team, and they are working on improving that. Yeah, so it's nine to x and different. All right. Uh, so how to go fast with Kotlin? What to do in Compose? So the first rule is to benchmark. The second rule is obviously to benchmark again, and the third rule is to benchmark on UCI so you don't accidentally regress performance after you just fixed it. Um, the next thing that I found really useful is to verify the compiler output sometimes. It's like kind of static analysis tools maybe, or maybe you just statically look for it yourself and you find certain things that are slow just because in Kotlin code it's not always obvious. It does a lot of things, a lot of cool things and a lot of interesting weird things. And the last thing is to know the cost of the building blocks. Like you use coroutines, how much all of those things cost. You use collections, what is slow there, what is faster, which is more frequent use case in your case. So this is things like that. All right, that's it for me. You can find me on Twitter uh, with this handle. Uh, obviously, don't forget to vote if you like this talk or if you dislike this talk, or if you don't care. Um, if you have any questions, we don't have, don't have to have, don't have time for that, unfortunately, right now. Uh, you can find me on the Google booth. I'll be there like afternoon and maybe right now as well. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, so I'll be there today for sure. Uh, please find me, ask me any questions about Compose performance, whatever you want. Thank you.